Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, this week we're taking a look at the changing nature of work and the work ethic as it obtains at the end of the 20th century. Has our understanding of the nature and function of work really changed so radically since the beginning of the century? I'm joined by the sociologist Professor Richard Sennett, whose book, The Corrosion of Character, The Personal Consequences of Work in the New Capitalism, has just been published. He's currently a visiting professor at the London School of Economics. By the historian Theodore Zaldin, who's a fellow of St Anthony's College, Oxford, he's just published a book called Conversation, and is currently conducting research and experiments into the future of work. And Melanie Phillips, who's a columnist on the Sunday Times, currently working on a book about the sex change state, which will discuss the division of work. Richard Sennett, can we start with you? What's really new about work now in the 1990s, and why do you think it's worse, as it were, than it were before? Well, I think what's new is that the time frame of work is shortening. Businesses and, indeed, government agencies being reorganised so that short-term task-oriented labor is replacing, obviously, jobs for life, but even long associations with companies which themselves are long in, in business. I don't know if it's depressing, uh, but it does create a problem, which is how are people to organize uh, their work to realize long-term purposes, uh, how are they to practice traditional work ethic like delayed gratification in a short-term world? And I think these are problems uh, that can be solved or at least dealt with, but we need to have a conversation about about what the realities of this flexible work pay, place actually do to people's experience on the job. You're talking largely about what we could call the Western world here, aren't you? You're talking I am. about what you could call the uh, industrialized manufacturing technological world. That's yeah. just to set it where we are. But you, from your book, which is case studies of, of different mm. people and you interview them, it comes out quite clearly that you think that the long-term employment with one firm in one place for one time, doing a craft which developed your sense of self-respect and uh, integrated you with your fellows, and <coughs> when a Greek <laughs> baker was a Greek baker who could really bake a Greek loaf and so right. on, those days of now gone, they press, press buttons in the same bakery. That that was a good world, and what we've got is a far, uh, far less satisfactory world. You're very clear about that. Right. You, you well, I, th I wouldn't... I mean, it was a world that suffered from routine, but it was a world that had been with us for long enough that people knew how to, particularly working-class people, knew how to extract something of it personally. This is... Uh, this great change in work, which has happened in the last 30 years to middle-class people, is something that's new, and we don't know how to, as it were, ride the beast. There have always been periods of great you know, uncertainty in capitalism. I mean, it's, it comes with the territory. But I think this is an era that's unusual in that uncertainty and risk have been pursued uh, with a kind of positive vengeance. There's also been a, a greater willingness now than there was a century ago to displace middle-aged workers in favor of the young. These are these are basic changes in emphasis, which which are problems that have to be addressed in some way. As a historian, Theodore Zoldin, <clears throat> would you say, as I might say, that actually over the last two hundred years? work has been switched around, people in bulk have been thrown off the land and out of factories and there's been a great deal of uncertainty and that what Richard Chan is talking about may be a, a refined version and a, a local version but it's been going on for a long time. Absolutely, I agree with this and uh, your suggestion that now we're in a greater hurry than we were in the past but there are people from the continent who came to Britain in the 18th century who said the English gentleman is... He's a terrible man. He's always running around, and you can never stop him. He's too busy to say hello. And uh, I think perhaps it is not in the in work itself that we have a problem. It is in people's ambitions. Our aspirations are different now. In other words, we are educating people, and, of course, they're more curious, and they want to do many more things in life. They want to have seven lives. And therefore, we have to invent new kinds of jobs to satisfy them. I think you, when on, coming in here, you said we are the two romantics of Britain. <laughs> <laughs> we are. <laughs> and romanticism has two sides to it. One is to admire the past, 
but you don't admire the past, but you do suggest that when people knew where their careers were leading and so on, life was easier when you could start a career and go to the end of it. But the whole of modern history is about the children of such people running away from that kind of rigid formula and uh, wanting more adventure. <laughs> I just wonder whether um, you may be overstating the centrality of the workplace to these great changes that you're talking about, because what you're talking about is, you know, lack of stability, um, the collapse of attachments, the erosion of the nature of commitment and trust. Now, I don't disagree for a moment those things are contemporary phenomena, but it seems to me they're more generally rooted outside work. I mean, for example, one of your case histories, uh, this uh, Rico uh, chap that you refer to, uh, laments the collapse of parenting. And you seem to be implying that the collapse of stability and attachments at work is somehow responsible. But the collapse of parenting is to do with the erosion of, of authority generally. The erosion of hierarchy at work, the sense of progression, is part of surely a more general trend in which we think that in the interest of democracy, it's wrong to have a hierarchy of values. But we've, we've all got to be equal. On the other hand, you don't mention what to me is one of the great changes and very threatening to men, which is the erosion, the, the willed collapse, if you like, of the role of the man as breadwinner, uh, the idea that men and women equally must participate in the workplace, even if women have, you know, nine children at, at home. Yes, but as Melvin has rightly said, men and women worked together in the fields in the past. And then there was this middle-class period of, of one, one or two centuries when men said, OK, we can earn enough and you stay at home and uh, wear nice clothes. And now this has come to an end. I mean, I'm worried about phrases like the collapse of parenting. I'll come back to Richard Sennett in a minute. Um, people with huge families in traditionally industrial districts, uh, I'm not being sentimental, but a man who went down a coal mine didn't have much time for parenting. And a per person in steelworks didn't have much time for parenting and so on and so forth. Per people who worked on the land in the rural poverty over what is now the Western world for hundreds and hundreds of years didn't have much time for parenting. I think the collapse of parenting, to use that phrase, is to take a very short-term perspective. But I must come back to Richard Sennett. What I have found in the people I've talked to is uh, that the relation between the family and their work is not a neat fit. The man I interviewed whom you, you mentioned is someone who wants to teach his children how to make commitments and how to delay gratification. He wants to teach them discipline in their schoolwork and loyalty to the family and so on. But they don't see that is something he practices in his own life. He's a consultant. He moves from job to job, task to task. He doesn't profit by commitment, nor does he practice self-discipline. I think that economic conditions that underlie work today are very different and in produce instabilities in a very different form than the kind of ruptures that... Can that you give are, us an... Uh, can you refine that a little? Give us a... Well, better take on that. In the 30s, there was, or the late 20s, early 30s, there was uh, what we call the offshoring of production now, movement, sudden movement of a chip factory, which is suddenly shut down because it's cheaper to make chips in Burma and ship the chips back here. That kind of quick change of offshoring basic labor was just not as pronounced. Uh, the rug gets pulled out of people in much more unpredictable ways now. And there's a good and a bad side to that. This new flexible capitalism has opened up incredible opportunities for working-class people in the third world. And conversely, those opportunities have diminished the prospects for workers in this world. It's a very different change. Uh, the technologies of communication in firms were nothing in the 20s to what they are today, when on a computer screen you know what's happening worldwide at a glance. From your, the research that you're doing at the moment, uh, Theodore Zellman, do you find uh, the changes as marked and as significant as suggested by Richard Sennett? Well, you know, he, he quotes the American statistic that an American would expect to change jobs 11 times and change skills three times in a, a lifetime. Well, this is exactly what a labourer would have done in the 19th century. And it is um, mm. surprising how the working class, who have no particular skills, put their hand to anything. But the main dissatisfaction I have with your argument is <laughs> that 
you're looking at it in a um, from sort of unhappy point of view, or saying things aren't happening well. You know, you don't like what's going on. You don't like this poor man who's a consultant. Um, but you can look at it the other way and say, here we have young people who are not satisfied with the way the world is working and who are trying to invent something different. And uh, I am very struck by the possibility of doing new things. For example, you, one of your bogies is the corporation, uh, which sacks people. But when you talk to people, in, this is an answer to your question, I talk to corporation people, they are obsessed by having a good image. They want to be seen to be of service to the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they do um, at the moment is to get a brand consultant who will tell them, put an advertisement up. They could do something completely different. They could say, we are um, a corporation with an enormous amount of skill and knowledge, and we could use that knowledge for the public good, and we could become a kind of edu educational institution. Melanie. Isn't one of the things that's happened that um, the <coughs> instability and insecurity that the working classes always have taken for granted has simply progressed into the middle classes yes. and that we're finding yes. people who have command of um, the media and culture, people like yourself in academia, um, are themselves feeling the chill winds of right. insecurity right. for the first time and have constructed a whole edifice of a great cultural change. But actually, as far as I can see, the figures show that um, among over 35s, I think, both in America and here, there is just as much stability as there ever was. Um, and this, but I do think you have a point that there is a, a general cultural collapse of attachment and commitment. But to go back to your RICO chap, surely it's more important that a child is brought up uh, with the two parents committed to each other. Those are the lessons that are really important. The fact that the, that the father is working as a consultant, it, it doesn't actually matter if the father isn't, isn't on hand. Um, that's not the point. The child knows that the father is committed to the child, the father is committed to the mother. It's that collapse at home which is much more significant to the collapse of the, this idea of trust mm. and commitment and negotiation and relationships are difficult and problem solving and all the rest of it. Sure. Let's mm. assume that there are changes because we could play games about whether it's changed or not. We could even play games about the state of Madrid, this being new for the middle classes. You only have to read Vanity Fair to show the middle classes were collapsing and rising. One of the first things I was taught about history at Oxford, the, the gentry is always rising and the gentry is always falling and, uh, in <laughs> England and that's the story of England, <laughs> England for a long time. So let's just forget that and let's say it is new now. Let's work on that hypothesis for the rest of the programme. So where does that take us? Now, Theodore Zeldin, you've, you've, you've come back with Socrates as the answer to this, haven't you? Well, what I've said is that the desire of people today is to be understood and to have someone who would listen to them and to be recognised as people um, who are worthy of respect. And you have to start with this rather than talking about the structures of industry and so on. You have to reconstruct um, the way we function um, creating jobs to suit people as they are now instead of trying to fit them into jobs which they don't like and which are too boring or which do not allow them to become better people. May I say, I took your book a slightly different way, which is uh, what I've had people say to me over and over again is that there is no real talk at work, that it is very difficult although people are constantly nattering on about communication, actually telling and getting a boss to listen when you say this is the wrong way to do this yeah. is impossible. And my, my answer to that yeah. is that you cannot learn to talk at work because there are all sorts of constraints at work which stop you speaking honestly to your boss. And like the way, power. Like power. And the way <laughs> to learn and to fear. talk <laughs> and fear. Well, it's all this, is, yeah. is at home. And I'm saying that the... The originality of our times is that men and women are now equal and equally educated, or trying to become equal. And yes. the conversation between men and women is the great revolutionary force in our time. Yes. You actually do stress that. I'd like to bring out to the listeners how strongly you stress it and how well that point is made. And you say that when Socrates, uh, not, let us say, introduced, not discovered, the art of, of, of cross-examination, really, that uh, made uh, thought clearer because individuals worked together instead of working apart from it. Yeah. Monologue was replaced by dialogue, and dialogue led to discovery. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm saying that in modern times we're trying to go further, we're trying to say what can men and women do together. And what they can do, above all, is to give each other courage. The great missing bit in uh, Richard's book is the courage. What, how can one get beyond the present situation? 
I took what you were saying to be about more than conversation. It was more a sort of uh, a call for an expression of sort of human sympathy, um, an engagement with, uh, with experience, an engagement with other people, a kind of reaching out, a sort of transformative experience, which um, I you know, found very uh, engaging as an argument. But I wonder whether um, you're being a little optimistic about the sort of society we're living in, because it seems to me that we're actually um, talking against each other, that we have a kind of adversarial culture in which we're all sort of in groups and not seeking to talk to each other, but seeking to drown each other out. I mean, there's a great deal of name-calling now. You know, we, we categorise people. We call them phobes of one kind or another, both in terms of national and sexual identity. And this is all designed to shut down a conversation in order that our group, whatever it, however, however we, we define it, wins over the other group. So we're moving away from um, a society in which we're all no, trying to talk to each what, other. What you're describing is something very traditional, that um, people argue and people try to win the argument. Um, so when I come here, I see that Richard and I are, have slight disagreement, but I would like to put those disagreements aside and say, what can we do together? But do you think we're now in a more cooperative society in which we are all No, we're not in a such a society. Yeah. We've got to make such a society. Can I come back to something you said, uh, Richard Sanders, which I, think, well, I thought was very interesting. It seems to me that one can work on the hypothesis that, that work has changed, uh, maybe not massively and maybe not radically, but has changed and will change more. And the centrality it had in people's lives, the necessity it was for people, that is one of the big changes. And you, there's a sentence here which took my fancy. You said, the qualities of good work are not the qualities of good character. Now, could you take us through that? If you're a good craftsman, that doesn't make you a good human being. And in the modern workplace, uh, giving satisfaction, this is, I've found this over and over again, the people who really took satisfaction from their jobs were not people who were necessarily uh, well with other workers, you know? They weren't people who were cooperative and, uh, and so on. They tended to be rather inwardly turned people who liked focusing on a task and getting it done and moving on to something else. And that's very well rewarded in flexible corporations. They aroused enormous antipathy in other people who felt that their the competence put the others to shame. Uh, they tended to be in rather inward turning. And in some sense, that's, that has always been a problem in labor. It's just that its terms have changed now. It is that people who are good at doing things quickly and focusing on a very specific task rather than being leaders of others tend or being cooperative with others tend they tend to succeed. What do you think about this relationship well, of work to character, uh, Theodore? Um, I don't agree. I think the what makes... It's so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> what makes, what makes, and I've always thought of you as a friend. <laughs> we are friends. I mean, I like what you do. <laughs> and um, let me just say what I, what I think. Um, the, what makes work character building is whether one gives satisfaction to others. And if one is seeking a direction for work to take, it is how to do what one, what one does should be of use to others. That's ideally. Yes. That's not how the real world works. No, no, no. But no, the modern idea in, in uh, retailing or anything else is customer satisfaction. And they're giving enormous amount mm. of effort to trying to reach down so that you talk to your customer. I agree, I agree they do it very superficially, and there is much to be done, but I, I believe that it is possible to um, encourage those kind of firms to get beyond this, their superficial work and to establish better relations with individual customers, and this will happen. Melanie, where does the, where does the uh, division of labour argument come in between this, uh, what Richard and Theodore have been saying? Well, it doesn't really come in at all at the moment, which is why I'm trying to sort of get it in. Mm. Um, I mean, Theodore, well, that was my rather clumsy way of saying Theodore, let's get to that subject. Yeah. <laughs> Theodore says, you know, men and women have always worked side by side, shoulder to shoulder in the, in, in the fields. I mean, I'm, I think that's true of some societies at, at some times, but I don't think it's a sort of universal. And certainly in uh, recent experience, in recent uh, centuries, there has been a division uh, between men and women, and the point of division is when women have children. And I do think there is a very important difference between the way women and men see work. Um, and I say this division Absolutely. occurs at the point at which they have children. Because it seems to me that 
work is a way of b- both bolting men into into a family, a sort of bargain between a man and a woman, but also work seems to me to give a man his sense of identity in a way that it doesn't give a woman. Ultimately, a woman, you know, if she has children, um, that is sufficient. I'm not saying there aren't many women now, and I am one, who work and, ha- and have children for whom work is very important. But the bottom line is that if you deprive a man of work, it does something to him, which it does not do to a woman. And I think that is true now and probably always has been true. I can see, uh, just as a matter of interest, I can see through into the, uh, s- from this studio into the control room, and I've got three women shaking their heads at what you're saying, Melanie. So where does that take you? Well, uh, they will disagree, um, and we're all, you know, having a... Um, but that's because we're all career women. Um, you have several identities. Yes, uh, but this idea... Men too. This idea that, too. that is now commonplace, that we're all unisex individuals and we all play exactly the same roles, not complementary roles, but exactly identical mm. roles at home and at work, that is what public policy is now predicated on, that men have got to turn themselves into new men and be at home hands-on caring. If they're not at home hands-on caring for their children, they're not being parents, which is uh, standing on its head, the idea that... Uh, a man brings to parenting and to the home a complementary role. And sim- uh, simultaneously, uh, the idea that uh, women have to work at all times, that otherwise they don't have self-respect, they don't have the respect of anybody else, even if they have children at home, which leaves unresolved the question of who looks after the children. Melvin, Melvin, I would, I would like yeah, to, to push this to idea of division of labour a bit Fine. further, Fine. because division of labour means specialisation. And I think this is what has got us into difficulties. And uh, women are pioneering a multiplicity of employments, um, as well as home caring and so on. And this is something which has a future, it seems to me, when we can all do several diff- different jobs. And uh, so the outlook, far from being negative, as you suggest, I think... Um, points but the problem with this is that many women don't like that. I mean, career women in this studio may all uh, be doing, be straddling these two separate spheres. But studies show that, in fact, a traditional family, the reviled traditional family, where there is a clear separation of roles, is actually where the two individuals, the man and the woman, are happiest. That there are terrible tensions set up in trying to straddle two spheres, and that you know the working mother actually cops it all. I mean, you say you know multiplicity of roles, I and mean, you you bet. Um, the working mother, you know, is, is playing at least two roles simultaneously. Well, I think so, lots of us are playing lots of different roles. I go back to an earlier point made by Theodore Zoldin that uh, one of the liberations, I think, for the end, for certain fortunate people is the uh, capacity to lead several lives. And I don't think that only applies to women, and I think that uh, that, that, that is one of the... the but real, my point the is really real, about real, men. That is freedom, isn't it? That but is my point is, is really about men and the centrality of work for male identity. And I'm worried about polls hmm. that prove who's happier than anybody else. I've never known a poll made happiness with any, uh, within an accuracy of 100%, frankly. And anyway, Richard Sennett. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I think in some way what you're saying is uh, economic reality is going to eclipse. It is very difficult now in both Britain and the United States and certainly in Germany and France uh, for a middle-class family to survive on one income. Mm. Uh, it isn't a question uh, about traditional versus modern. This is... the for women after they – this is a great change in, in the labor market the last 20 years, that women stay uh, employed full-time in middle-class women in the labor market after they have children. That's not a choice. It's a necessity. Mm. And uh, because it's something that has to happen, uh, given the economic conditions we live in, to think about role – differentiating roles between men and women and the family is going to have to take on a new – configuration too. But isn't one yeah. of the reasons why two incomes are now necessary is because male wages have been driven down and one of the reasons why yes. they've been driven down is the, imp- is the influx of women into the market? Not really. Not, not, st- not economically. Male wages have stagnated and women's wages in certain kinds of, of labour are also beginning to stagnate as well. It's much more complicated than that. It isn't that the women have sort of batted men over the head by enter- middle-class women by, by entering the job, job market. But even if it were true in the past, even if what you say were true, which I, I'm afraid it, it isn't, uh, the reality we have now is that most adults, whether they're men or women, are going to spend most of their conscious hours working. This is an improvement from the time when a family could not survive unless the children worked from the age of seven. Yes, we have to remember that. Can I just come to a conclusion by saying 
You are both uh, academics, and Melanie writes about these things. Are you doing anything more than trying desperately to catch up to what's going on and going before you? That work <laughs> is changing so fast, that the division of labour it's, and it's going on at different paces and different rates in different parts of the world. One of the things that a subtext of your book sort of says, well, it would be better were it like this. And your book of conversation says, well, why don't we do this? And Melanie's is saying, well, it would be better be like this. Have you a hope of uh, a, a changing things yes, by I'm thought? Yes, I'm doing something. I'm, I've got into firms and uh, I found a firm which say, do what you like with our firm and use it as a laboratory. Good. And I am trying to do it. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to create things in my work on the French millennium which will change people's lives. Well, that's a straight answer, Theodore. <laughs> <laughs> I asked her about the complicated <laughs> Bang, OK, right. What about you, Richard? <laughs> well, I don't think I'm changing people's lives. Uh, but you do think that actually a change in the capitalist system would be... But I'm just yes. saying, is well, it sort of almost out of control? What can no, I don't believe that. I actually think that what we're going to see is a period in which corporations begin to reconsider the long term and to think more long-term, rather than short-term profits are oriented to their stock price. And at that moment, I think we'll begin to be able to sort out a little more what this kind of flexible work is, is like. I've, uh, I know this only. I've, I work with unions, which are also paralyzed <laughs> organizations. I'm not pessimistic about this. I think we have a problem in the way work is organized, and we have to learn how to solve it the way earlier generations did. One thing that's odd about your book, in a way, is interesting, is that this mm. chap, uh, Rico's father, yeah. who uh, d worked as a janitor and did tremendously yeah. well and saved up for his family and looked after him, has a great deal of self-respect. And his son, who did masses of things as well, by uh, has very little self-respect at all. So it's, it's, in a sense, to do with self-regard as much to do with the actual work you're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. Success is not self-respect. Mm, I mean, it's, exactly. a, it's cliche, but it... it one of those cliches that happens to be true. Mm. <laughs> I think it, this lack of uh, uh, self-respect is to do with the lack of the feeling that one's actually producing anything. And increasingly, um, I think, as, yes. as has been said uh, before, um, people are stopping producing and they're talking instead. And despite um, <laughs> Theodore's advocacy of a proper conversation, I think that's uh, as somebody who makes her living from words, both written and oral, I think that can only be uh, regretted. But how do you get self-respect except by... Um, getting a sense that other people find what you say worthwhile. You get it from other people, right. not from yourself, ultimately. Well, thank you very much to Richard Sennett, Theodore Zeldin and Melanie Phillips. Next week I'll be joined by the historian Simon Sharma and Antonio Fraser. We'll be discussing the study of history in the last decade of this century. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4.